Thanks very much, everyone, and thanks, uh, Mark, for the introduction. Um, as someone so interested in cultural diplomacy, it is always heartwarming to see people from all over the world with all kind of different interests, but focusing on one goal, that is working hard towards global peace. This is always very uh, wonderful. Like my Mark said, um, Francis Adams is my name, a Ghanaian national. Um, my PhD research is titled Promoting and Protecting Indigenous African Cultural Heritage, but through digital and cultural diplomacy where my case study is located in South Africa. And in South Africa, I'm also cooperating and collaborating with other research institutions in Zimbabwe and Botswana. Now, my focus in this research is on the uh, San ethnic group. Uh, all that I'm doing is with my research is to find out um, how we can use digital platforms to promote human values in our communities as a step towards uh, global peace. So today, what I'm going to present is not necessarily the research work, but rather my meditations. You know, meditations are very important if a research is uh, based on emancipating the locals, I mean the most vulnerable in society, then meditation forms part of it. And it is all about, you know, I just want to share to you, with you, why I think that um, promoting the human element in our digital age could help us tackle urgent issues in regards to climate change and also in regards to reinforcing our family values in society. Yeah, now I think um, we all know that digital media has provided us with uh, various platforms on which we could promote our cultural values and norms. The advantage is that we could learn from uh, one another's cultural uniqueness in order to make a positive change in our communities. In that way, together, we can make life a bit more easier for one another. However, we all know that using digital platforms to create awareness about our cultural uniqueness is one thing. Steps towards positive change is another thing of its own. In steps towards positive change, uh, we might require some technological know-how, but for the change itself to happen, it has a lot to do with the human element. Human element here, I mean, change has a lot to do with our attitude and character. It has a lot to do with the individual meaningful persistence and whether our strategies and approaches are unique enough. Now, this is what I term as a human uh, element. So if you believe and agree with me that the human element in our cultures, in each and every culture, the human element, if that is important in making a change, that some of the cultures that I would like us to look at and perhaps meditate on are indigenous people and their cultures. And the reason being that with all the hardships that surround indigenous people in their uh, natural environment, studies have shown that indigenous people have been able to live a sustainable life without causing much harm to our planet. And now the question is, how do they do it? How have they been managing with it, living a sustainable life without um, causing any harm to all? Little harm, just little harm to our planet. How are they doing it? Now, at this point, I would like to share a personal experience with you. It's not coming from studies. It goes like this. I grew up in an indigenous setup back in Africa. I mean in an environment where hunting and gathering were our main sources of survival. In such an environment, you have to constantly, constantly compete with your fellow living things for the same sources of food and water. Success depends on whether your strategy is unique enough. And unique strategy means that a high quality of information, isn't it? Great. Now, that is where the trick is. In nature, source of information is all about what nature has already made available for you to see. In other words, survival depends on the correct interpretation of all that exists around you. One can always find food, but first, one needs to know where to look for it. So what we used to do, for example, in gathering is this. 
by just seeing some uh, specific insects, some specific animals or specific plants at specific locations could tell you what kind of wild fruits or tubers you should be looking for, yeah? In hunting, there's a process called uh, tracking, yeah? To track down any animal means you need to understand the psychology of this animal. It is kind of like a science of its own in tracking. Okay, now, to do this, again, you need information. And how do you get information? Just about asking anybody. In nature, we really don't consider ourselves as, you know, the people, but everybody is everybody. Respect is there for the plant. Respect is there for the water bodies because of interdependence. So by just maybe picking up some of the feces of this animal, bring them into pieces, you will be able to get a good deal of uh, history of this animal you are trying to track. At least you will be able to tell where this animal was the past uh, no, uh, 24 hours earlier. Or by just looking at some of the plants uh, that it grazes and the quantity of these plants that this animal grazes, put everything together, will kind of like uh, help you to predict the age of this animal, to predict the gender of this animal. So putting all these things together will bring you closer to getting the psychology of this animal right. The reason why I'm giving all these uh, simple or primitive examples is to help us answer the question as at how indigenous people, they live their lives sustainably without causing harm to our uh, mother earth. So now, let's bring that to our uh, modern world. We have a, a, a kind of like culture that interdependence, respect, respect for one another is their way of life. In our modern world, I can tell you that each and everyone here in this lecture hall may be worried about climate change, yeah? The reason is not because we don't know what to do as human beings, but the reason is because uh, as human beings, we are constantly, constantly refusing to see the signals, to see the symptoms and signs that climate change is showing us. So now, we have two sets of cultures, two sets of knowledge, and two sets of people with, you know, their, their human element. My question here is this. What do you think if these two sets, indigenous people and our modern people, if we could come together at eye level to talk, to have a dialogue, and if possible, learn from one another, don't you think we could come out with, I wouldn't say perfect uh, strategies, but don't you think we could come out with honest, yeah, honest strategies that we could use to tackle some of the issues regarding climate change. This is just a point that I think we can all meditate on. Okay, now my point number two is um, again on the human element, promoting the human element in our digital age. But at this point, I'm focusing on how we can promote our family values. I think in recent years, the world has recorded quite uh, high numbers in democratic or political surprises all over the world. Electoral surprises. The world is recording electoral surprises all over the world. It has happened in the United States. It is happening in Europe. And it has happened in Africa and keep on going. Um, the world has recorded quite high numbers in... Uh, legal issues between uh, prominent individuals and even between regional corporations or organizations. For, for example, the European Union, alongside some of members, its member states, against some of the digital search engines like uh, Google in the area of intellectual property rights. This is something I will encourage um, my Ghanaian colleagues or African colleagues in governance to have a look at. It is really ringing a very important bell, the issue between the European Union and uh, Google concerning intellectual property rights. Now, all these things, in my opinion, are happening because there were quite a lot of important things in the form of information. These things were covered for a very long time. Now, digital media made it possible for some individuals to go around taking off some of the covers and then discovering what is real 
all these years but was hidden. So society is reacting to that shock and this will still go on for some time. So if you look at it from that perspective, you will say that digital media has really empowered the most vulnerable in society, you know, to stand for his or her rights. That is positive, but now, all these uh, surprises, political surprises, legal issues, and all this happening, they have an, a negative effect. And this is in the form of um, our contract, contracts, working contracts. These surprises are making working contracts to become less and less reliable. Okay, and you ask yourself, working contracts as a risk management tool in transactions, if these become less reliable, uh, what then is our business future? Okay, digital media has increased speed in almost everything. So organizations and companies, they are more interested in employees that can give them instant results. Unfortunately, such instant results are in the form of numbers. So the idea that I should deliver my contractual obligations and still make teamwork bearable for my team colleague, this idea is slowly but fading out, okay? Now, there's a worry, a worry because if this way of life finds its way into our policy-making system, whereby uh, policymakers will not see the need to promote human interaction, yeah? where policymakers will not see the need to promote human interaction. What will happen is this. At the end, one of the things that will suffer most is our family systems. And you can imagine um, a society without good family values, a society without respect for the elderly, a society without respect for children and people with disabilities, a society that will not see the need to protect animals and water bodies, yeah? Again, I'm not giving a lecture, but a point for all of us to meditate because each and every single one of us has a power in us that the only thing that is left is for us to act and act meaningfully. So what I'm doing in uh, Southern Africa with my research work is to try to find ways that I can promote uh, data-based policy governance. When I say data-based policy governance, what I mean is to see or to come up with a concept whereby African col uh, cultural policy makers would see the need to base our cultural framework on holistic, I mean holistic cultural research. And then in that way, from there, we can be sure of an all-inclusive governance, yeah? And if we achieve this aim, then digital media can effectively help us to preserve the human element in our society. So, dear friends, as it is a point, points, as these are points for meditation, I think I would like to share it with you. Please, you have my contact on the board my email address, francisadams2004 at yahoo.com. If you have any idea, if you have any suggestion, if you have any thought, please feel free, send me an email. We can always talk about it because my research is for the people and together we can emancipate the most needy in society. So thanks and let me know if you have questions. Okay, great. Um, listen, almost all our projects that are going on in Africa, projects you call African projects, most of them are donor funded, yeah? The issue with these things is this. These projects are not planned in the countries. There's little local uh, contribution at the planning level. So they come in to implement these projects. Let's say the San Ethnic Group, who have been living in nature for all their lives and live happily with nature, somebody comes and says, we want to use this particular location as a game reserve for biodiversity. So 
all the indigenous people get away from there. We have created a place for you close to a city. Go there, we will have a clinic for you, we will have this for you. Forgetting that that is their heritage, the land is their heritage, you take them away. So this particular group that has been moved, in no time their culture will be completely gone. Their identity will be completely gone. That is a huge effect on the indigenous cultural heritage. So I might be doing one case study in South Africa, in Zimbabwe or Botswana, but this can be replicated even beyond Africa. Okay, this is what I'm trying to see. And listen, we can use the digital media to create awareness about the good things concerning indigenous cultures. Okay, if we have these platforms, uh, so that like, you remember um, things like Bring Back Our Girls? Remember Connie 2012? Remember Hash Me Too? If these things w w are that powerful, okay, why can't we come together and kind of like raise awareness about specific indigenous groups who are really suffering equal pain? You know what I mean? Besides that, uh, even like the European Union itself, what they are struggling with Google, as I mentioned earlier on, is all about you know, protection of the individual. If you study the, the case very well between you, EU and um, Google, you will see that, or you may say that the digital development to, be, to start with has taken the European Union and some of its member states by surprise. In other words, if they could reverse things, they could have given a bit more power to their legal systems in order to protect uh, the individual privacy up to a certain level. But some of these things are already too late. What is not late is the business function. And all the European Union is looking for is maybe to come up with an honest but a simple consumer template that will give honest, okay, honest detail of how much proceeds these um, digital search engines are generating from their activities so that the tax organizations can take the appropriate taxes. But we all know it that when it comes to the issue of um, money, many things can become very slippery. Even if they do not have social or scientific reasons to be slippery, they could become slippery. So this is an ongoing intent. So to that extent, from the local level to regional level to continental level, digital media pe play an important role in liberating indigenous cultures. Yeah. You know, access is always an important thing. Whether people will want something or not, give them access. Already you are providing options for them to choose. Okay. Um, in, with indigenous people, remember that these are the people with the most diverse and most unique cultures. If you bring digital platforms to them, first of all, you need to train them how to use these platforms. Secondly, for what? Okay, if they will use it to enhance their way of communicating, if they will use it to demonstrate their cultures positively, where you can go on the internet and just search for the Sun Ethnic Group, you see all the wisdom in their fairy tales, wisdom in their food search, wisdom in their music, they will do it. If you have to buy a cultural product from a Sun person in Southern Africa, and you go in on the internet and buy it electronically so that there will not be a middleman to take part of the money. My friend, they will do it because that will promote the local economy. Okay, and this with indigenous people, one thing is that some difference may be there, but if you get the concept right, you can replicate it all over the world.
Okay, three more hands. <laughs> okay, so make it short. Yeah. Effects. And that is the issue of yeah. So how do you, uh, yeah, uh, my brother, you know, whether we like it or not, cultures are changing and they will keep changing. They have changed before, so they will, we can never stop cultures from changing because the world is revolving around. However, mm, we have to find strategic ways of protecting the core essence of our cultures, okay? So in Ghana, for instance, um, it was not common to serve a visitor with uh, what we call uh, in Safufu, out in the local language, what do you call that is palm wine. But you serve a visitor with what? Coca-Cola, with Fanta, with all these things. This is one thing that we are completely losing, yeah? It has its meaning. Okay, now, whether we like it or not, westernization or globalization is at us, but uh, in terms of governance, in terms of policies, we need things in place to see what is coming into the country. You know, local content development, that is, are you repackaging local content for local use or for external purpose, or you are repackaging external content for local consumptions, then, States with all the cultural experts surrounding you with international rules and regulations would help you what? See what is good for your people, what is good to preserve your cultures. So what we need is a kind of like a system in place to see what may be known as the bad from the good, you know, adhering to international rules. Yeah. Okay. There were two more there. Okay. Ah, sorry. We, I'll come back to you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Inclusion is very necessary. Yeah. And I think that that really happens because no matter how effective your plans and your implementation procedures are, if these indigenous people does not cooperate with you, does not accept the concept or project you want to implement, it results in conflict in one way or the other. And as we know in Ghana, you Yeah. Yeah. I got you. And um, we also you made an example with palm wine in Safufu and Pato Cola. I believe that um, I've been a lover of palm wine since it was <laughs> But um, when today we look at um, palm wine, international competition within the market is very necessary. So we cannot also, in a way, curb the other products that get into the market. But what are we doing to improve? Because um, I would say that as age grow up, how I live in Sapopo, as I can see today, if I could get one, there is so much difference. What has been done to improve some of these contents to compete? Okay, the, great. Uh, let me let let me join you with that. That was why I was saying we need um, kind of like research. Research is a central figure. Okay, researchers, cultural researchers need to be encouraged to come out with ways and means of packaging the local products or produce 
For example, you mentioned uh, palm wine. They, wouldn't, they shouldn't take much to preserve palm wine, but that it takes a lot to advertise palm wine. How many times have you seen somebody welcoming a visitor on an advertisement with palm wine? You will not see it. It is being done by other um, drinks. You know what I mean? This is, a, this is all about uh, policy. But back to the point where you say uh, you disagree with me that these projects are being developed and all this. The stakeholders meetings and all these things, these things come, but at kind of like a second stage of the project's development. The usual projects are being designed by donors, yeah? They are designed by donors. They are developed by donors. And um, I have to tell you that a project, success story of any project, depends on the planning level errors. The less planning level errors you have, the likely you will succeed. Now, these people at indigenous level, these projects, so to be say, mostly are imposed on them. And that is why there are the conflicts, like you said, all over with indigenous people worldwide, worldwide. They don't have a say in the planning level, no. They finish everything and then bring it and impose it on them, yeah? Great, uh, there was one hand, um, yeah. I have a quick question yes. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, very good question. Yes, I, 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 at the beginning, I told you um, I'm collaborating with some uh, institutions within the Southern African region, like NGOs. They may have funding possibilities, or at least look for funding possibilities, where there will be digital platforms set up, and of course, train the locals train these indigenous people how to use the mobile phone, how to participate on online conversations, what kind of content can I put online, yeah? How can I sell my produce, like locally made bundles on the internet? Yeah, that is why I see it important to collaborate with many NGOs or organizations within the region. Okay, there's one more hand here. I will go there and come back to you, yeah. Thanks. Um, I come from Australia and it's an international conference for me. And in our country, we also have quite large issues um, with the indigenous population, and that stems from the historical and colonial regimes in yeah. which uh, the indigenous population was definitely persecuted. Um, and so today, I think it's not so much an issue that there is a lack of access. Yeah, um, I think you are very right, but also have in mind that it differs from country to country. Yeah, uh, you cannot, maybe if we have to compare Australia, the issue of Australia with any country in Africa, it will be quite different. Uh, like for example, in the Congo forest, you know, in, you know uh, across that belt, it's not even e easy to reach out to the people. Go to the Kalahari Desert, the sun, people are there, some of them, you know, quite remote. They might not have seen a mobile phone before. So the states have 
either way, if you go on the streets of Haboroni, the streets of Harare, the streets of Johannesburg, the local person have access to all these things. But what about the indigenous people? You know, so it can also differ from country to country. But thank you so much for that. Okay. Yeah. Second question depends. I wasn't sure if I heard you right earlier when you were talking about comparing like Coca Cola and Fanta. Did you say um, advertising calm wine? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, let me take the first one. How can we come eye level? First of all, we need to humble ourselves. Those of us in the, um, the modern world, to humble ourselves means that we need to agree or accept that there are quite a lot of good things we can learn from indigenous way of life. That is the beginning. If we have that, then we will have respect for the people. We cannot come to meet them. We cannot meet at eye level if we do not believe that they have something good to offer. And to believe that they have something good to offer, we need to be humble, patient, and learn from them. First of all, we have to make ourselves students. Yeah, for them to teach us then slowly we can come to a point that we will also be able to share with them what we know. So it will take a certain strategic kind of approach and process. So time is needed to, to come to this point. And then, yeah, this advertisement I was talking about, that is um, uh, from our brother who was quite concerned that the world is changing, globalization has taken over everything and everything. You know, globalization, yeah, it has its destructive part on cultures, but we shouldn't also forget that the same channel is there for us to turn things around. To turn things around, like, again, on the issue of palm wine, or a, a locally made food, yeah, you can use it to also advertise, to also promote this. But who is doing it? It's all about the interest. That brings me to my next question, actually, depending mm -hmm. on how I heard you. Yeah. So as far as things like Palm Wand, just to give a little example, Adam's best in South Africa, and he always goes there and brings back wine. And he always says it's because Americans are so dumb about wine. They know red and white and nothing else. So with that as a starter, how do we, each of us in this room then, how do you suggest we go out Well, uh, first of all, if you are going to Africa, it depends on your interest. What interests you to go to Uganda, to go to Ghana, to go to South Africa? Now, if you have heard a lot about palm wine in Ghana, or let me take a kente clove, which is one of the Ghanaian's traditional cloves. You know, it is worldwide known. Many people that travel to Ghana will make sure they come back with a piece of kente clove. This is just an example. It is awareness about what the people, the locals value a lot. And then it's up to you to feel like you want to be part of the locals by their culture, or you still want to maintain a distance and find your way through. So it has a, a, a kind of like a bit to do with interest and a bit to do with awareness, what is available. So this is what I would say. And this um, poly, you know, cultural framework could easily kind of like adjust well, not to cut off something, but to put everything online so that you have options to choose whatever you want. Yeah. All right. So if there's no question, I would like to thank you all very much for your patience.